meeting is being recorded. Thank you so much, Veronica. I always love to hear you read that. Your, your voice is so clear and I understand every word that you say. It's, I love your accent. I met Teresa via Zoom because of COVID and I fell in love with this woman. I mean, she shares so honestly, she articulates extremely difficult concepts very well, makes it very simple so that anyone can digest it. She's just so real. I mean, she just really touches my heart. And I've also, because of over two years now, seen her go through some trials and uh, she was in college when it started and then had to quit going to school to take care of an ailing sick mother who's in hospice care. And uh, she not only walks the walk, but she walks the talk. Please help me welcome Teresa. Thank you. I'm gonna time myself. I'll go over. I don't know why I do that, but okay. Hi everyone, my name is Teresa, I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be here, grateful to be sober because of a loving God. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to your meeting. The title in itself is so intimidating. <laughs> and then I'm like, am I emotionally okay? Anyway, <laughs> so uh, I always have a share before I share, if you don't mind. It just helps me out a little bit to take the power out of it. Um, I was telling my sponsor that the other day. Other than that, I'll I'll try to act like I'm cool and I'm not. <laughs> in my head, it's just going. Uh, and that is that I'm uncomfortable. Uh, this is awkward and intimidating. To be vulnerable. You know, sometimes I just choose not to, um, but it requires it. And I love how some people say, you're just talking to a bunch of drunks. And I'm like, they're the most judgmental, cynical like people. And I know most are thinking about themselves, but they're thinking about themselves and why I'm not doing anything for them if I'm sharing. So I just find that kind of funny. Uh, I'd rather share in front of a PTA. So anyway, <laughs> They're always uncomfortable, but it takes the power out of it. I just have to say that uh, and get it out the way. Ah, especially when I have so much stuff going on, to be so transparent. Um, I'll begin with my sobriety date. My sobriety date is March 29, 1990. This is my birthday month, one day at a time. I've been with you all for the last 32 years, and I don't know what he's supposed to say, 11 months or something like that. I don't know, 32 years. Uh, I want to welcome anybody who's new. Welcome home. Please keep coming back. And old timers, thank you for my life and my sobriety. Oh, man, let's see how we unpack this. First thing that kept coming to my mind as you were reading that is I think this has been recent years. I um, I find that I'm in less judgment of all of it. And what I mean by that is this. I remember some years ago, my brother had died. My father had died. And man, grief is really something. And someone suggested I reach out to this old timer. And I called her. And I was sharing with her what was going on. And she just kept saying, ah, I don't know. I'm just no longer in judgment. And she said it again. And then I hung up from her and I was like, well, thank you very much. You know, like usually some of the old timers is like, whatever. You know, I don't even know what they were talking about. Maybe 10 years later, I'll get what you're saying. And then I found myself about two or three years ago talking to somebody and they were going on and on. And I was like, huh, I don't know. I'm just no longer in judgment. And I was like, oh, no, I did not just say that. <laughs> Oh, I get what she was saying now. And that's what I was thinking when you read it that when I listened to Bill, him sharing his experience is the sense of awareness, right? We reach this kind of consciousness and awareness about these things. I think if there's so many gifts given to me in sobriety, and for me, one of them is the gift of awareness. You see, when I'm asleep and I'm unaware, it's not a problem to me. It may be a problem to the rest of you, but it certainly isn't a problem to me. And that's how I drank uh, 
I didn't have a problem with incomprehensible demoralization. I didn't notice. It was only when I noticed that it became a problem. And so in my journey in sobriety, you see, I heard, I heard you stop growing at the age you started drinking. So you stop growing emotionally at that age. And I always introduce that sponsees. I'm like, when, what age did you start drinking? How long have you been sober now? Oh, so you're really only 12. You know what I mean? You're only 13. And so I came into Alcoholics Anonymous emotionally an infant. And that's because I started drinking in my mother's belly. And I came out of my mother's belly premature and addicted. And they gave me alcohol. And I drank my entire life until I was 24, going on 25. So literally, I was emotionally zero. I had no point of reference. I had no ideas about love and intimacy. And even the words we were using there, pride or ego or self-worth. I didn't even know about wanting to be loved or cared or needing others. All of that, I didn't, I didn't know any of that. I just knew that, and I always say this, that alcohol betrayed me, abandoned me, and left me emotionally retarded with no coping skills. And I knew I could not function another 24 hours without the only thing that provided oxygen and the ability to live out a day. And so I came blank. And I, I sometimes I wonder if that was to my advantage. What do I mean by that? I had nothing to bargain with, right? I didn't have any wits about myself to kind of think I knew something or had something going. I was like, I know nothing. It's like we go to the big book study and we open up the blank page. We've been doing it on our 12, uh, 12 traditions. You know, you open up the blank page. They told me to read it. They said, what's there? I said, it's blank. They were like, exactly. You know nothing. That I let go of what I think I know about myself, the disease, alcoholism, God, and you. I know nothing about nothing. And what it did, it allowed me to go on a journey of discovery. It was an invitation to find out. Uh, and my noon meeting today was contempt prior to investigation. And the contempt is this assumption that I know when maybe I don't. And so my journey in recovery was about investigating, asking myself questions I wouldn't otherwise ask myself, listening to other people's experiences and see what applies. And if it doesn't leave the rest on the shelf, my whole 32 years have been that way. I'm having a new experience. Remember my sponsor, when I would go through something, she would say, it sounds to me like you're having an experience. I'd be like, you think? Uh, more and more gets revealed. Uh, there are times I, I really believe that I finally arrived at some greater awareness about myself or God. And then like a month later, I found out I even know what I was talking about, but it sounded really good a month ago. You know what I mean? Like I totally thought I had it. And I think that's what I mean by less and less judgment, right? And so this is about a practice. I've had to implement these steps in my life in order to grow along spiritual lines, emotional lines. Uh, and I kind of gave into the infancy of my development. You should have seen me when I was two years sober. You know, I was in my terrible twos. I would literally watch children in particular right after my nephews were born, and I would watch their progression, emotional progression of development, like the normal, natural progression. You know, I'm a sociology major. I've had, I got two degrees in psychology. And we talk about these things of our phases, healthy phases of development and deviancy. And I start looking at that. And I believe that I have been raised in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I say, I feel like a baby in a baby basket left at the doorsteps as though I was adopted by AA. Uh, I had to first I had to discover what I had learned unbeknownst to me subconsciously and then unlearn it 
and then see how to do it. I mean, that has been my journey. I can stop, I can have 10 to tantrums. Uh, I I came so emotionally detached. Like I, I used to live like the movie Death Becomes Her. I would have bones sticking out of me. And, and I mean, people would be like, you know, you're going to put it back in? Uh, things would happen and I, I, whatever. I remember it took me three years to cry. My first inventory, I said it like I was just, I don't know, reading somebody else's novel. My sponsor's mouth dropped and she was like, we need a moment of silence. I have referred to movies a lot because it's very visual and it helps me to kind of understand what could be going on. But my first, in, my first fifth step, it was like that movie, Goodwill Hunting. You know what I mean? She was like, it's not your fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> and why are you, you scaring me? I, three years. I was so robotic. I, I, it's just so funny. We talk about emotions. I literally had to learn what they were first. What is love? I would, I had to learn like, how are you feeling today? I would, I don't know if anybody knows about this. It's a therapeutic thing, but it's like a post of all the feelings with the faces. And I would have to look at it and be like, I am confused. <laughs> I am disdained. I mean, literally, this is how I've been raised around here. <laughs> I'm uncertain. And you know, it's interesting. I think Joe meant like articulate. I spoke to people with an index card for at least the first six to eight months of my sobriety. My, because I couldn't differentiate the truth from the false. It was until I got sober that what started coming to me was all the things that had happened to me, right? So they call it now, I have new ad PTSD. I didn't, I was just having the PTSD experience. I didn't know I had a label, you know? I just, I was never like present. I, uh, everyone was a perpetrator. I come from physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, nothing but abuse for 25 years. And so the way I saw the world, as I began to understand, wasn't based on necessary reality, but whatever these memories were in the past. So anything that would happen, immediately I would think you're attacking me. So how would I say that I need Others, if I'm not even sure who I am in all my affairs. I mean, literally, that's how it's been for me in my sobriety. I don't even know where I fit. And so my sponsor had said to me, since I wasn't clear about anything, she would say, whatever someone says or someone asks you, just tell them, I'll get back to you on that. Let me know. We'll get clarity on what it was. And then a response. So talk about willing to go to any lengths. And I will come back to you with an index card. I remember I even did it at work. I call my sponsor. I don't realize that I'm offended, distraught, that my whole identity and, and my self-esteem and self-worth and validation is based on the opinion of my employer. I didn't come with that language. We can call that emotional maturity immaturity but of course I was I, I don't even know what that is I didn't even know just like a child you know what I'm saying if you ask the child that was a year or two years or when they begin to to speak they can't tell you how they feel a baby cries when something's going on that's how I felt I can't tell you I'm crying because I don't know I just know something is uncomfortable and I'm crying and I needed those around me to help me to say, are you hungry? That's how I visualize. You know what I mean? You, are you hungry? My sponsor said, are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? You see what I'm saying? Have you eaten? Did, are you tired? I just know I'm having a tension tantrum. I don't know what's happening. And I didn't know that's what was going on in my job. And I would call my sponsor and I would be like, my employer told me that I was supposed to make 200 copies instead of 100, and he hates me, and he wish he would have never hired me, and he's trying to figure out how to get rid of me, and he doesn't know how to run a company anyway. You know, why am I working for him? And then she said to me, 
I mean, I'm just going on and on talking about character assassination, about all that I am and the state of victim consciousness. And then she said to me, let me ask you again, what exactly did he say? Did he say all those things? He hated you, want to get rid of you? I was like, no, he told me I was supposed to make 200 copies instead of 100. And I literally had to go back and I had to sort that out. Where was that coming from? What is that all about? What is it bringing up? What is it affecting? The steps have helped me tremendously. What am I afraid of? Where am I being selfish about this? Like I, I literally, I mean, geez, my reality is distorted. And I had to go back to, could you imagine? I would go back and read, with my index card. With regards to the copies, <laughs> I recognize that I have overlooked, <laughs> it was an oversight on, <laughs> here are the other hundred copies and I will be mindful in the future. I mean, could you imagine? <laughs> so it amazes me today when people say how well I can articulate because I had to learn words. Uh, surprisingly, and I tell people they're very surprised, English is my second language. I grew up speaking oh. Spanish. We're Puerto Rican. It, it, we speak Sp uh, Spanglish more than anything if there isn't English in there. Uh, if you listen to anyone of us, especially Puerto Ricans speaking Spanish, we start talking and then bust out with a bunch of words in Spanish and then get back to English. And so I have to my think in Spanish and I had to learn where, oh my goodness, the work I've done to grow along, along spiritual and emotional lines. What is it that I'm trying to say? I, I don't know if it's a therapeutic word, but somewhere along the line, I heard something that was called ice. Identify, clarify, and express. And that's how I can melt away, right? This coldness and this wall and protection around me. And I would have Ready? to- Wanna eat? I would, oh, on. I would have to- I wanna eat? with kind of like what's going on with me first kind of and the steps help me do that clarify what's really happening here and then learn how to express that to someone and this is how I believe I've grown up I've also been gentle with myself for not knowing for being needy for wanting to be loved, just like a child. How can I turn to my nephews that are three and are extremely needy and begging for my attention and just, you know, call it emotionally immature? It's appropriate for their age. Do you understand know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> and that's how I saw me. It's appropriate for my age emotionally on whether it's my neediness, my desires, my wants. It's changed through the years. And then there are then there's times I feel really evolved and healthy and mature. I've also done adult children of alcoholics, Al-Anon, and, and I've taken parenting classes uh, to change language. I can self-mutilate and assassinate myself far more than you ever can to me. And I had to learn new language on how I even speak to myself. I'm so used to other people not loving me. You see, I didn't even know that I needed your love because I was so used to never getting it that somehow I thought I resolved that I never needed it nor wanted it or needed to look for it. So much inner work. Sometimes it's been exhausting. Sometimes I'm like, I don't want to learn anything today. I'd be like, please, God, I think I've had enough lessons. I remember I went to this woman's meet. I always remember this woman said, I want to talk to a scientist because I want to find out how many, she used the word effing, uh, freaking layers there are to an onion. I thought that was hysterical. That is so true. Like She was like, am I getting close to the core yet or what? Bill talked about the prayer of St. Francis. You know, of course, for me, it's always been safe in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous to give selflessly, but yet selfishly. 
because that is part of the process of recovery and that is what is required in order for me to recover is to be of service to others, whether it's coffee commitment, secretary, uh, sitting across a newcomer with a big book going on a 12-step call. See, there isn't a whole lot of uh, investment. I don't know how to, I, I've always found that interesting. My uncle used to say, uh, love is unconditional, but relationships are conditional. So the way I work with men and women in the fellowship or sponsees, I would like that to be similar to my intimate, close relationships, but I think that's unfair. I don't have the depths of that intimacy with those I sponsor and members of AA as I do my lover, my mother, my father. Those relationships touch all of my basic living instincts of survival. You see, with the newcomer, as Bill was sharing, I freely give because it's the, it, we were reading about that. The individual only survives if the group does. So see, that's the agenda of my survival when I'm working with a, with a newcomer. My survival is that I give it away in order to keep it. But my survival on how we eat, how we dress, how we love, that does not apply when I'm working with newcomers. That's why I'm okay when they leave. I don't know if that's making sense. I had to look at that. Why is it that I so freely am open with people in the fellowship and newcomers and I struggle with family members? Well, it's a different dynamic of relationship. But then what does it look like when I've had re long-term relationships with sponsees? It's one thing when I just met you and you just move on or disappear or drink again. But what happens when I begin to develop deep, emotional, intimate relationships with sponsees for a long time? See, I don't judge myself today that when they just disappear, it hurts me. And that doesn't make me emotionally immature. As a matter of fact, that makes me a person who cares. That makes me a person who loved, who, you know what I'm saying? That's what, I don't know, that's what I've been learning. Like, if, if you, if I've been sponsoring you for 20 years, and one day you don't talk to me anymore, and you don't even tell me you decide for me not to be a sponsor, and you completely disassociate, if I have no emotional response to that, then I'm back to not feeling anything at all. So I don't deny myself of that. That means I cared. You know what I'm saying? That means I cared, I loved. That's what I learned about that. I've been the caregiver to most, other than my dad, my abusers and my perpetrators in my family. And each and every one of those relationships have stretched my spiritual muscles of spiritual and emotional, mental development. Each and every one of those relationships showed me where I relied on them or things about them. I'm not going to say other than my higher power, because at the time, that's how I understood my higher power. I'm, words are important to me. You see, I'm th it's not that I'm relying on them other than my higher power. I have an understanding of my higher power, and it looks a lot like them. Just like a child, I'm dependent on my father and my mother. Why wouldn't I be? I'm childlike. Someone asked me the other day, what did I really learn? I took care of my uncle with three to six months to live. What did I learn? Oh, my goodness. That was the biggest one that I started um, taking care of. My uncle was so verbally abusive. And it was like, what, was, what would he say that I, the biggest thing I learned from him? And it was wanting to be loved. I didn't know that's what I was doing. I didn't know I was jumping through hoops. People throw terms around here like codependent and not self-care. I, I don't I, I, I don't know about that. To me, those words make me, I don't know why they bring me shame because it gives me the idea that I can do something different. The, the steps has taught me that I am motivated 
by selfishness or fears, not because I'm a bad person. It's just that I think that's the only way to go about it until it doesn't work anymore. And then I go, uncle, uncle, maybe there's another way. And I did that with my uncle. It was part of being of service. It wasn't self will run riot. I do prayer. I do meditation. I talk to my sponsor. I sit with it. I believe that's my assignment. But in that assignment, it's almost like the defects of character. That's why I say, God, take all of me, good and bad. It seems that even some of that defect of wanting to be loved, God in some way used that for me to arrive at that level of understanding. Just you know, say, it motivated me so that I can arrive at a place and say, part of what I'm doing here is unhealthy because I'm seeking love and validation from you and I'm never going to get it. But I wasn't a bad girl for seeking it. Why wouldn't I? It's my uncle. And then the freedom came when I said, God, remove that. I I'm no longer responsible for that or to make that happen. Let go of how I'm playing God in that area. And then I was able to be a niece to him and walk him through the end of life for the next 31 days without that attachment. And there's a spiritual maturity that happens there. I did that with my father. I am daddy's little girl. He loved me unconditionally. I'm a spoiled, rotten little girl. Why wouldn't I be? Everyone always told me you are nothing. You are nobody. You're insignificant. You're unimportant. You're ugly. You're stupid. Daddy was the only one that told me I was beautiful and wonderful. I hardly ever asked my dad how he was doing. Selfish? And it was only later in sobriety I started, you know what I mean, asking God to remove the selfishness that I... I I matured and going, how are you, daddy? Okay, now back to me. So like that was progress. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even stick around to hear the answer. <laughs> and my father had Parkinson's and I grew there because I was so used to receiving for him and hardly ever giving to him that when he got sick, oh my goodness. Ooh, talk about growing up. I had to be the giver and he didn't even know who it was that was giving. And I got little in return but until I learned that I got so much in return being the giver. You know what I'm saying? What a trip. My brother. Who used to beat the living daylights out of me. Even he was amazed that I was taking care of him and raising, helping him raise his two boys. I grew so much with him. I was terrified of my brother. Of course, I wanted him to love me too. I respected him. I, I wanted him to see me as a, finally as somebody who, you know, who wasn't stupid. And I, you guys, I've been through so much. And you know what I mean? Like, whoa. That's part of the course. I'm willing to go to any lengths and I'm willing to show up. And I always remain open-minded to learn and uncover, discover, and discard. And as I do that, I see myself mature. And then there's sometimes I see myself revert. You know, it's kind of, that's why I'm in no more judgment of it. And just, I thought I set this alarm. Okay, where are we at? And just recently, my brother was hard. Oh, that was, oh. Man, why was that hard with my brother? I wanted him to live longer so we can, so I can grow up more with him. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was so excited. I remember, um, oh, that was something. I was terrified of my brother. It, it, my brother was, he was the smartest person on earth and mommy made that known and everybody else. Even my cousin was saying, everybody loves Tony. Everybody loves Tony. My brother was, oh my God. And I treated him the same way. And if I ever, I always felt like I was doing something wrong around him. And I remember he came to me once and he said, I want to have a relationship with my sister in today. Why is it that every time you and I have a conversation, we go back to 860? And that's where we grew up in New York and the projects. 
another opportunity. I mean, the little girl was meeting him every time. Do you know what I mean? In his shadow. Even he was aware of it. And I looked at that. I talked to my sponsor. It was scary. I made amends for what I needed to make amends for. And I began to grow up emotionally with my brother. You know what I'm saying? And I noticed when it started happening, I think uh, Everett was, my nephew was learning Spanish and I was helping him and my brother started yelling, don't be talking to him in Spanish and that broken Spanish. And the teacher said he has to not talk to people, whatever. He was just so angry. And oh, my brother got angry. I was like, I'm in so much trouble. And in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually growing up. Because in that moment, I was having an experience with my brother in present time. And it wasn't like I'm now putting on my big girl panties and I'm going to show you I'm a grown woman. I just had grown to this place where I was addressing that incident or fence or I was dressing it in that moment. It wasn't all the other times. And all I said was that hurt my feelings. I was just trying to help him. And in what way am I causing him harm? And he said, I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? Like, then I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, you guys have no idea. That, that was huge. And I just wanted more of that. And it was only like about two years later, I had to put him on life support and not resuscitate and take him off. That broke my heart. I like that. Do you know? Enough that right before I put him on the machine, the doctor said, is there anything you want to tell your sister before we put you on the ventilator? He was struggling to breathe, man. And he said, I love you. And I said, I love you too, Tony. Talk about emotional maturity. I actually didn't need him to say that. I didn't need him to love me at that level, you know what I'm saying? But I received it and I think it's significant and important. The fact that I can even receive that, appreciate that, respect that, acknowledge that, acknowledge that why wouldn't he? I'm something to be loved. And for me to actually say I love you and mean it. And that was the last thing he said to me. I've been broken ever since. I've just been growing up around here. Sometimes I get jealous, you guys. I get jealous of folks who rest on their laurels, who don't, you could call it a judgment. One of my biggest character defects is self-righteous. You know, it's like, I watch people. I'm like, oh, must be nice. You don't have to work a step. You can go to a meeting when you want to. You don't have to build a relationship with God. You know, you could just focus on career and traveling and love. I haven't had that luxury. It's all been about spiritual work and, and letting go of, of what wasn't healthy and what is healthy and giving my life to God and being a servant of God and serving my fellow man in the rooms and outside of the rooms and my family, learning about obedience and Oh my goodness, it's all a bit about my relationship with God. I was talking to some Ali to understanding that there have been three major higher powers that have impacted me. And one was alcohol. That was my higher power before I came to you until it abandoned me. It was my puppet master. And I needed to find another one. And you introduced me to one here that I found fascinating. To me, it's the ultimate higher power of all higher powers because it needs your permission. It asks you to walk hand in hand alongside of it. It loves us unconditionally. That's the ultimate higher power. And there's another higher power that dominates what I call this dimension called earth and planet that I don't believe most people discuss it or want to admit it, 
but there's a higher power that everyone relies on to the point that about 98% of our decisions are based on this power and it's money. And one of the things that bring me the most despair it's not so much that you leaving me or love me or don't love me. I've been working on that one, man. You know what I'm saying? Is this relationship with money. What I can do, what I can't go, where I can't go, uh, what I can do for funeral, what I can do for health care, what I can do for where I can live, where I can't live. Oh, that's a higher power within itself and how to have a healthy relationship with that power. That I don't have to give up all my worldly possessions and go live in an ashram, ashram, whatever they call it, or a convent in order to just serve and live a spiritual life. I love how they talk about the prayer of St. Francis. St. Francis didn't write that prayer. He talked about striving towards that prayer. It wasn't even the prayer. It was just the life of St. Francis. And then they wrote a prayer about it. And even St. Francis himself couldn't live up to that. The human condition, it's unrealistic to ask the human condition to live up to something so ultimately pure. To love rather than to be loved? I'm no longer in judgment about that. I will strive towards that. I will do my best in inventorying and cleaning house to move towards that. But I will not shame myself when I would like to receive that. You see, I lived my life before not needing anybody to love me. You know what I'm saying? And I kind of like being loved. I think it's a beautiful thing. Does like my sponsor told me, isn't it a beautiful thing when you love others? Isn't it wonderful when you give others? Isn't it so fulfilling when you understand others? Why are you so arrogant and selfish that you won't allow anyone else to share that with you? I had to learn that lesson. Hmm. Only I want the gift of the prayer of St. Francis. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. And my mother's been the, the ultimate one. Mommy, I knew she was always going to be the ultimate one. Mommy died on November 10th. I still feel like it happened yesterday. I have been more confused and lost than ever before. And before mommy died, I've been taking care of my mother my, my whole life. I have learned through the steps and practice and uncovering. Oh my goodness, mommy was my biggest teacher. My mother would be like, I'm going to show you how spiritual you're not. Watch this. That's been, that was mommy's role. You think you're spiritual? Check this out. <laughs> I've taken, I've been living with my mother, taking care of my mother for years. For years. She calls social services on me. Anybody who wants to hear I'm the most horrible daughter on this earth. And they come and I say, when are you taking her? Where do I sign? My mother died with 30, 36 years of sobriety. And I would go to her home group if it wasn't her anniversary and go, this her home group, where's her sponsor? 12 Steps ain't helping her today. Oh, mommy and I did the dance. She was my greatest teacher. Mommy showed me what was unfinished, undone, where I was immature. Oh, my goodness. And before mommy, I knew it was coming. Mommy had Alzheimer's. Imagine an alcoholic sober but can't do the 12 steps because they don't even remember and they don't remember i'm kind of like no she's living like she was living when we were growing up but just she has an excuse and you're calling it alzheimer's that's alcoholism with with another label anyway <laughs> y'all calling it something else i've been living with that my whole life now she can get away with it and I kept saying, you know what, you guys? I kept sharing in meetings, writing about it, talking to my sponsor. You know what I'm concerned about when mommy dies? Who am I going to blame for my misery? 
My mother in my 57 years of my life has been the reason why I can't be, I can't go, I can't do, I can't have. And I've done a lot of work on myself. I remember I was sharing that with someone in the program and they said, oh, now you get to do your homework without any interruptions. I was like, exactly, you didn't hear me. You see, when I don't get my homework done, I could blame her. Now I gotta do my homework. You see what I'm saying? Talk about immaturity. And the irony of the relationship with my mom is that my mother depended on me my entire life. She felt I had no need to be born. I should have died. And she tried to kill me many times over. And when she resolved to the fact that I wasn't going to die, then I was going to do whatever she needed me to do, when she needed me to do it, and how. When I say jump, you say how high. That's how significant you are. And I loved my mother. Everything I ever wanted from her, I did. You know what I mean? I did for her. Because she deserved it. I had to learn I had not walked in my mother's shoes and I did not know the depth of her pain. She was bitter. And my mother depended on me and I grew dependent on her being dependent on me. I grew to depend on my brother being strong. Like all these relationships, I'm looking, they're all gone now. Everybody's dead. Like that was my spiritual, it's just so interesting. And towards the end, this is really, unless God did this to get me to the finish line with mommy. In all these years, it was in the last year, mommy had a brain hemorrhage in February. And in January, for the first time, I started receiving compensation because she always had a share of costs. I started receiving compensation for taking care of her. And I've taken care of everybody without getting a dime and not working. God's my employer. And I just started getting money. And when she got a brain hemorrhage in February, I remember I freaked out. And I called my sponsor. And I said, do I care about this lady or I'm worried about the money that just started coming in? I'm confused. What's going on with me right now? I'm worried about mommy. <laughs> Do I really care about this woman? What is happening to me? And he said both. What a new experience. Mommy didn't even last a year. And when she came home after that brain hemorrhage, call it whatever y'all want. I'm glad that I'm willing to look at the things I need to see so I can continue to grow. You know what I'm saying? When mommy was here, I was doing everything I could to keep her alive. I needed her the most. For the first time, I needed my mother the most. I have cameras, you know, she's sleeping, you know, like when the babies, when they're babies, like I did with my nephews. Are you breathing? Are you breathing? You know? And when I put her, when I got to the emergency room, whatever, it's a whole story. Her stomach was big, whatever. I take it, go to the emergency room. I show up, she stopped breathing, and I have to put on that ventilator. And I, I met with my nephew, my sister in law, my cousin was on the phone in the parking lot. Mommy's now on life support. And she got a lot going on. She probably ain't going to make it. And I tell you guys, this has been a journey. And I said, you know what, you guys? I just got to get this out. Before we move forward on all the decisions that got to be made, I just got to get this out. I got to say it out loud. And I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> no. that's a trick for me. 
I couldn't believe I would ever be like that with my mom. Had to do a financial. I don't think if the money had a role with it, I'd probably have been like, finally. I'm saying a lot of stuff to you. I've been going through so much with this with my mom. You know what, how interesting it is? My nephew said to me when mommy died a few, what, a few days or a week later, it's fascinating to hear from the mouths of babe. My nephew is 20 years old, was there when my brother died, he was 10. Now he's 20. And he said, you know what, Titi? I know that's my grandmother. And I'm going to miss her. I loved her because she had you and my dad. But I'm going to say it. I'm happy for you. He said, no, I hope you learn how to live. How to do whatever you want to do. Go where you ever want to go. Dream whatever you want to dream. I don't know how. Not yet. I've been shaped and molded and all the little things that I've learned. You know, all the little things God's been shaping me and molding and stretching and, and are, you know, finding words to articulate. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know where I'm going to be color potent right now, but man, this is what a journey I've been on. And I'm so uncomfortable because it's unfamiliar having a new experience. And my mother's funeral, I found it fascinating that during her service and we started walking down the aisle. See, I pay attention to things like this. Well, talk about needing people. Really, folks? That's my mother. I'm walking down the aisle and I'm saying something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. And most of my family and sponsees, as you can tell, I like some kind of order and control. <laughs> Can't be a caregiver as long as I have, you don't know how to work with spreadsheets. Anyway, and <laughs> delegating. Okay. So, and they're thinking that something's wrong with the services, right? Flowers are missing. They're like, anybody listening to her? What's the pre-stress, right? You know, what is she trying to tell us? What did we forget? Are the, follow, are the flower colors in order? And I was just saying, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Something was happening to me and I didn't know what it was. And then we go, we come out and I, they put her in that hearse or whatever that car is. And I, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Imitation of Life, but I'm having an imitation of life moment. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's seen that movie. <laughs> and I'm screaming. And the thing that I'm screaming, anyway, imitation of life, that's how it looked like to me. And I'm screaming. And what I found fascinating is what I was saying. I kept saying, what is happening? What is something is happening? Something is happening. It wasn't, oh, mommy. Do you know what I mean? Oh, my God. I kept saying, something's happening. Something's happening. Something. What is happening? What is happening? And afterwards, I, after everybody calmed me down, I talked to my sponsor. I said, what was that? And he said, you're so used to assessing, processing, and compartmentalizing. And the moment you kissed your mother goodbye in the casket and they closed it, it seemed like all those years and all those people just came upon you and you had no, it was like an avalanche. And that's why I was like, something's wrong. What is happening? Because I didn't know how to articulate. You see what I'm saying? I didn't have a box to put this in. I didn't have agitate adjectives to allocate to it it was just out of control something was happening to me and i believe that that has also been my process of growth around here and that is not intellectualized or compartmentalized is that it has always something has happened to me and i believe that's necessary so that when something happens to me, I can give God all the credit. Because if I sort it out, right, if I allocate it, right, if I label it, then I'll say I did it. And that's why I'm no longer in judgment. I'm watching God do what God does. 
I do the footwork. The only thing for me that has ever been so firm and true is that I'm an alcoholic. The one thing you can't take away from me is my sobriety. Cancer takes loved ones away from me. Alzheimer's takes loved ones away from me. Parkinson's. I've had jobs decide I don't need to work there anymore. I've had people uh, rent me their house and decide I can't live there anymore. I've had friends say I love you one day and then say you're nothing to me. I've had sponsees say you're the best sponsor in the world and tomorrow go you insignificant. I found somebody else better than you or what I need more so than you. I've had lovers say you're the, my, the love of my life. You're no longer significant, right? I've had so many people decide and so many things in life decide what I'm going to be or what I'm going to do with or without my permission. But you can't do nothing and nobody can take my sobriety from me. But me. When I rest on my laurels, I'm not willing to continue to grow emotionally and spiritually immature. And the disease of alcoholism kicks in and has a field day with me. I may not know who loves me. I may not know what's going to happen to me. I'm financially, oh my God, I can't even begin. I don't even know what's happening anymore. I may not know what's going to happen to me, where I'm going to live, where I'm going to go, how I'm going to pay. I've been, am I going to, do I keep the car? Do I got to turn in the car? I have question marks. Who loves me? Who doesn't love me? oh, Oh my goodness. But the one thing I don't have a question mark is that I'm an alcoholic. And I don't have to figure out any of those things. All I got to do is treat my alcoholism. That's how I grew up around here. I continue to do this work. I continue to show up. I let go. I let God. I give myself a break. I do the best I can to love and understand others. And I'll end with this. I've been given a new invitation. I told my cousin I was so concerned. Believe it or not, now I have an illness that is so bad that doctors like you have broken heart syndrome. Your heart is about to stop at any moment. You are on fight or flight. Your PTSD is kicking. And right now you have to reduce your stress. You cannot do anything. You have to start eliminating things around you. And I remember I told my cousin, I'm scared because as long as I take care of God's children, God will take care of me. I can't spend all this time focused on me. And she was like, that's interesting. I said, I'm so disappointed. Is this my assignment? She said, that's interesting. Is there a reason why you don't see that you're one of God's children too? Huh? You want to precious God's children too. And God's saying it's now time for you to take care of one of his precious children. And that's you. Something to ponder on, huh? So right now, I'm like a little girl. I'm emotionally raw. I want somebody to rescue me and hold me. And tell me it's going to be okay. I'm like a little girl whistling in the dark. I feel like I'm reverting, you know? Back to the unknowingness of all things and myself and my identity and everything is very interesting. And all it is an invitation to begin to ask myself some questions, to go inward, to begin to tap into this power for a greater understanding and intuitive thoughts and ideas, and then just keep helping others and just keep helping others. And I'm going to watch God show off and show out. And I know I'm going to emerge far more mature and stronger and more aware so I can do what? Come here to tell you about it. (laughs) So the newcomer has some hope that we do no matter what. I'm like an emotional basket case, you guys. 
if nobody told you they love you today, I really, really do. And I'm not sure if anybody loves me. That's okay at the moment. That's just where my head is. You know, I don't feel safe. But I'm not okay, but it's going to be okay. So I put one hand in God and one hand in this program. I want to thank you all so much for allowing me to share with you tonight. You've done a 12-step call on me. Thank you. Love you, Teresa. Oh, my God. There's just so much to unpack. I'm still processing a lot of the stuff you you said. I have so much identification. Um, Mark Houston talked about a dark night of the soul. And uh, we don't understand what's happening when we're going through it. But what saved my tush, and I think you're, you, you're saying the same thing, was newcomers came into my life. And when I was working with them, I was able to get through that. Okay, we're, we're at that point where you could call on anyone in the Hollywood squares, if you'd like. Well, I don't know, is anyone, can they raise their hand or no? I have they, to pick- They can do that too. You, oh, okay. You have the option can... to call first, or we can yeah. go first. You can raise your hand if anybody would like to share, that's more helpful. Then the person sitting there going, pick me, pick me. That's always a little bit more awkward. <laughs> I think I Carrie had his hand up first. Okay, Carrie. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, yeah, I thank you so much for your share. I jotted down so many little trinkets. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a damaged little girl. I'll tell you what. And uh I, when I came into AA, you know, I was broken and lost and didn't, I didn't want, I didn't, I, there were two things. I didn't want to be loved and I didn't know how to be loved. And, you know, it's like, you know, and now it's just like, no, that wasn't it at all. So, I mean, I totally related to a lot of what you shared and thanks for your vulnerability and just, yeah, keep on sharing because you reached me. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have Irina, I believe. Hi, Teresa. My name's Irina. I am an alcoholic. And thank you so very, very, very much. I love seeing you Tuesday nights. And I... In the beginning, it was like you were telling my story. I had one of those big sheets with all the emotions on it, uh, trying to figure out what it was that I felt and what the word for it was. Uh, and I still need it sometimes because I grew up in, in a language and an environment where we didn't have feelings and certainly didn't name them and certainly didn't express them. Uh, so I so related to that part of it. and just the growing that it takes to, to cross that, to try to cross that bridge. And um, I loved everything you said. I loved your honesty. I loved your sharing what it was like for you and your stages of growth. And I loved your walk with God and you have inspired me. And I thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Oh, I don't. I should do it this way, no? To see who's first, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, Teresa, I met you at NTE on Sunday morning, and I decided to sit in this meeting tonight. I'm so thrilled to see that you were going to do the lead and be our speaker. Um, thank you for one thing, and. I also can totally relate, not had a drink in a really long time, but not emotionally sober. I had a lot of damage also when I got here. We call it baggage. <laughs> Took me a long time to start looking at that and unpack it. And not everybody I was sitting in meetings with could hear me or could understand what I was saying. Those 
crunchy old timers back then just told me to quit feeling sorry for myself and get off the pig pot. And uh, that, that uh, didn't really cut it for me. And here we are all these, for me, decades later, I finally find this group that you are speaking my language. I was always uh, drawn to Bill's essay. I tried to read it and understand it, but I couldn't really find anybody to talk to about it. Um, and I did a lot of recovery, a, a lot of healing. Oh God, I just bounced off the walls for the first 10 years of my sobriety, really. And then things started to surface. Those deep, dark secrets started popping up. And it took another couple of decades to face all that stuff. But no, um, anyway. And so then COVID hit and, you know, we were sent to our room and I didn't really talk to anybody much and feel like I lost my voice and I'm still trying to recapture my place. This group is really helping me get grounded again. And um, so I, I really appreciate you so much for sharing and being vulnerable. And, and I'm so grateful that, that we all finally have a place to be who we are and to talk about how we feel. And nobody's going to tell us to get off the fucking pity pot. So thank you so much. And I pass. Thank you. I used to hear, get off the cross. We need the wood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought I'd say that. <laughs> uh, Cor Corleen? I'm calling and I'm an alcoholic. Teresa, I, uh, you're, when you speak, you just, you speak to my soul. Like, I don't even, I don't even really have to listen with my ears. You just speak right always, right into my heart and into my soul. And I thank you. And you are one of God's precious little children. And I cannot tell you how much you mean to everybody. When we're new, we, we get told, let us, let us love you until you can love yourself. You know, just, just keep coming and let us love you. Just let us love you and feel our love. Anyways, um, that's all. I just wanted to let you know that you are one of his precious children and you, I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it. You're one of his favorites. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Melanie. Uh, Melanie Alcoholic. Grateful to God for my life, my sobriety. I want to welcome anyone who's new. I'm going to try to pull over because I'm blind and I feel like I'm going to need a moment. I want to thank you, Teresa, and I for your share. Um, I want to thank you for giving me a front row seat, you know, inviting me in to watch how this thing works one day at a time and being of service to you like you've been of service to me. So thank you. You know, I remember reading uh, the, the part that was read today about emotional sobriety. And um, and I remember the awareness around my dependence on others. That determined everything for me. I needed others, you know, especially if I'm in a relationship. I'm always in a damn relationship, but they've never been good until this last one. And now it's gone, you know. But my awareness around that, after just reading it, like, no wonder, no wonder I can't be happy. No wonder I'm depressed all the time. I rely upon others to, to fix me. If I needed to feel love or happiness or whatever, I needed you to do that. You had to supply me with what, did I need, what I needed emotionally. And it wasn't until we took that fifth step that it became so much clearer, right? Um, I have definitely grown through this this process of the twelve steps, and you taking me through them, right? <sighs> know that your work is not in vain, and that um, 
although this process isn't always comfortable, um, it's necessary to be back here in these rooms at 55 years old and behaving like a teenager is just not cute anymore. I don't know that it ever was. I'm grateful to be growing in this experience that I'm in right now because I've been relying more and more on the God of my understanding. You helped me develop that. And I don't know when we're going to get to 12. We at 8 now. You got to just give me a minute. You got to just give me a minute. You know, I, I, I'm slow. How about that? But I know it's something that um I still want to do and complete. Uh, know that I haven't forgotten about you. Some of my actions are just coming from a place of my own self-care, you know, and just trusting God. I've been practicing that building more and more of my faith upon God and um and it's been working because I know that other people can't make me happy I can't get my happiness and my dependence upon paying my rent taking care of it sending me I mean everything I relied on was through others you had to do it for me and I didn't even realize how significant that was, how that stunted my emotional growth. So today, I feel like a 55-year-old woman, right? I don't need to be up front. Matter of fact, I want to have the, I want to have the senior, the senior care pass, and the, uh, the senior discount. And if I go to the front of the line, that'd be because age is before beauty. Okay. Thank you for letting me share. Um, I love you deeply. I'm going to keep coming back. Thank you. <laughs> Amy. Amy, I'll call it. Um, Teresa, so I love you. And that is part of the reason I got on this meeting tonight. Um, and it was funny because I was talking to a friend earlier and I was like, I'm so excited for this meeting tonight. Teresa's talking on the grapevine article the the next frontier like um to my like I love that article so much and when I saw that you were speaking on it I'm like I set an alarm because I like saw that it was happening like earlier today so I was just like so psyched for it and um you know the first time I saw you speak was uh at a young people's convention in Philadelphia I think it was like I don't even know 2009 or something and so when you, you talking about how you have evolved like tonight I was thinking about how I saw you speak back then and it's like it's true like you have evolved like from <laughs> and it's really amazing because like just like what was shared before this the part in that article that I love the most is when he talks about our deep dependencies um, on relationships or whatever. And then when those failed us, that's when the depression sets in. And I've had that happen. I can't even tell you how many times. And, um, and I always thought there was like something wrong with me, but like, I'm a lot like you, like, I can't rest on my laurels. Um, I get very sick very quickly. Um, so, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. You also mentioned how stress is affecting you. And I actually was at the doctor today and she said the same thing to me that she was like saying, um, stress is making your body actually physically hurt and you need to learn how to meditate. And I'm like, Oh, I'm in AA. They talk about that. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to put up my hand because I love you. And I actually, I was supposed to be at Jersey. Well, I went to Jersey Shore and you were supposed to be there. And I remember that's around, I think that's when, what happened with your mom. Um, and I was just so sad to hear that because, you know, I've seen you through the years and I just think you're an amazing woman and you're going to be great. And I do love you. Thanks. Thank you. Is it Luisa? Luisa! Oh, yeah. Como va? Hi, everyone. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Louisa. Hi, Teresa. Oh, my God. Every time I hear you, you just leave me just 
speechless. I'm always in awe. Thank you so much just for being transparent and vulnerable and, you know, just validating and showing me and us that it's okay to come undone. You know, um, yeah, our higher power, God's got us. And you just give me so much hope and you always have a message of such depth and weight. And um, I'm just so grateful to know you and to see you on Tuesdays. Um, and um, I'm just grateful for you. And I know your mom is grateful for everything that you've done for her. Um, yeah, she's up in heaven smiling down on you. So thanks for all that you do for in and outside of the rooms. Um, te amo. Thank you. <laughs> is that Ruthie? Ruthie? Hey, everybody. My name is Ruth. I'm an alcoholic. T, I didn't, I didn't think I could love you more. You, my sister, my never too early sister, through the past couple of years, I've learned so much, so much from you in, in probably the worst, your worst times. And I just, you know how it is in here. You feel like you, because we have that, we have this disease. We're, we're family. That's the way I feel. Um, yeah, like blow me away. Like I, I stopped breathing for a minute because I thought I heard it all in your story. And you got, I don't know what, I don't know what volume I'm on, you're on, but um, you blow me away. Your uh, transparency, your, your tears, your friggin' laugh. Even when I don't see that you on number two, I love your laugh. And I do love you so much, whether you like it or not. Boom. If I was your neighbor, I'd be like right over, like hugging on you right now. Cause you, you're, you're something, you're something special. Don't forget it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Do we have two more? We still have time. There's two more. No, there's three more hands. No, two more. Is that okay? No, no, Joe. Yeah. I have Gina. Yeah, we have enough time. Okay, Gina. And then we wrap it up. Okay. Hi, Teresa. Um, yeah, I love you. You know, I love you too. It's, it's, um, you know, I grew up in my, um, my parents, there's like a lot of illness. So I guess it would be more uh, mental abuse, but it was cruel. You know, I grew up with cruelty. So I couldn't feel anything because I was so afraid. I couldn't even move, you know, because I was like, oh my God. And, and I was thinking about something this morning that when I was getting ready, like, why am I, you know, if I have a job and um, I'm like, what should I do? Well, how can I do it? And I'm so scared that, that I almost lose the job, you know, cause, cause I can't do any, I'm like, well, you know, um, and I don't want to, you know, keep living like this. And this is like emotional sobriety. Like I'm not even emotional, you know, like I want to be able to, to do that. And I feel like when I drank, I kind of drank to feel my feelings, you know, because I didn't know how to feel them. And um, I'm starting to do that. And I don't know when that happened for you and what, because obviously now, you know, you, you feel them. So I'm still at the point you in my sobriety where, where I'm trying to, to figure all that out, because how can I really be happy, you know, if I can't, you know what I mean? I, I'm not really making a lot of sense, but um, that's where I'm at. And that's where um, I just feel so abnormal. You know, I feel like, like really abnormal, but it's so nice, not nice, sorry, <laughs> to hear that, that you kind of felt like that, or you did feel like that. And that everyone else here who's sharing, you know, also feels that way. So, um, you know, this is a great program. It, it really is. And, and I wish you the best. And um, I often wonder too, I'm in a really difficult place. Like this is part of my journey. Maybe this is what it's supposed to be. Yeah. I have like just 
everything too. And thanks for talking about money because that's one of my issues too that I don't really want to admit. But yeah, so anyways, thank you so much. Thank you. And I think last but not least, is it Jackie? Jackie. Yes, yes. Hi, Teresa. My name is Jackie and I am an alcoholic. I just want to say thank you so much for you your share tonight as like everybody said it just touched my soul and but the thing i really am going home with is you mentioned um about the difficult times and and when the invitation you talked about the invitation and i thought this is an invitation if i could start looking at different circumstances or whatever it may be um, it's an invitation to grow closer to God. An invitation to open up one more, I don't know, invitation. That is a beautiful word, beautiful word. And and I totally agree about, um, and I guess this is another area that has been brought to me, you know, the God of money, you know, and material and and then I kept writing and approval of others and this and that. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. God. Yeah, some deep, not deep, some really very surface gods I have in my life. And uh, wow. I, I thank you very much for your share tonight. Of course, Dawn. Wait, I can't, we can't close out with Dawn having her hand up. No more, no more after Dawn, though. Hi, I'm Dawn. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I, I will say there's only one thing I have to say that I agree with what everyone said. You Thank you so much because you speak a language that speaks to my heart. I think it, I laughed so hard when you said English is my second language. And I thought to myself, it's my second language too, because when I came in here, the only language I knew was like, it, it wasn't speakable in public, I can tell you that. So I had to learn how to talk. And sometimes it still goes downhill depending on my mood. But um, what I really wanted to do was make an announcement. I mean, the announcement is, and it's so disappointing for me to tell you that your, call, your talk, which is being recorded currently, is not gonna be in the Dropbox update that just happened during this meeting. I was able to um, kind of grease the wheel and make that happen. It'll probably be about a month or so until we can get yours on. I And I am so disappointed that I can't tell my sponsees to come listen to this. Thank you. Okay, we've come to the conclusion of a great, great meeting. Oh my God, I'm sure everybody's heart and soul was touched. Uh, what we traditionally do is we have a few moments of silence where we go into our inner room, pray, meditate, reflect, and then we'll thank the speaker.